Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Sambad talk. This is the third in the series of talks that we've been having on uh, the medical AI team. Today's speaker is Professor Rishikesh Narayanan from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Uh, Professor Rishikesh obtained his master's and PhD from the Department of Electrical Engineering at the IASC Bangalore. Subsequently, he held two postdoctoral positions, the first one at NCBS, National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore, and the second one at the University of Texas at Austin. He returned to ISC in July 2009 and currently serves as a professor at the Molecular Biophysics Unit at ISC. The overall goal of research in his laboratory is to mechanistically understand the ability of neurons and their networks to concomitantly achieve efficient neural coding and activity for new status. Specific topics of exploration include degeneracy in encoding neural systems, active dendritic physiology, neural coding and homeostatus, neuronal plasticity and calcium signaling in neuron and gli. His laboratory employs a combination of experimental and computational techniques to address outstanding questions in the field of cellular neurophysiology. So, uh, thanks a lot, Professor Rishikesh, for accepting our invitation. Uh, uh, glad to have you here. Looking forward to the talk uh, by Professor Rishikesh on um, computation and plasticity in the brain. Actually, many of us, in uh, particularly in ML, are uh, used to thinking of neurons as these um, dumb, oversimplified units which do nothing but a thresholding and somehow magic happens when you put them together in a neural network. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing a lot of insights about how real neurons in the brain actually work. Over to you, Professor Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction. Now, and thank you all for and thank you Professor uh, Neelam Sinha for having me here. Uh, uh, this is my first time on this campus uh, and I'm glad that uh, the first in-person uh, <coughs> talk uh, after COVID-19 started uh, uh, some 19th centuries ago. So, <laughs> so um, I have uh, I'm writing my talk as uh, um, computational classes towards uh, the So, so um, I always put the, the acknowledgement slide first because uh, uh, these are the people who actually did the work uh, on your left uh, and on your right uh, are uh, the funding agencies that have uh, funded the laboratory over the years. So, um, So these are the people who did the work. Uh, these are my lab people um, currently, and those are graduates and gone uh, uh, to other places. Uh, and those are the people who actually did the work. Uh, and these are the funding agencies who have funded me uh, and about the over the years. So thanks to them first. Without uh, uh, the people who actually did the work or the funding agencies, uh, the work that I'm going to talk about uh, wouldn't have existed. So, so let's start. Um, from the beginning, uh, so uh, which is from uh, Ramoni Kapanda, who is considered as the, the father of modern uh, neuroscience. Uh, so this is the, the 18th century or the 19th century view of how neuron functions. So this is called as the law of dynamic polarization. Now, uh, so so the idea is very simple. Uh, from today's perspective, we know that there are um, um, I mean parts of the neuron which are called as dendrites. Uh, so these are the processes that receive information from other neurons, uh, other brain regions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and there's a cell body that receives information from these dendrites. Uh, and the idea is that uh, this cell body over here integrates information uh, from across different locations. Uh, and if that information, that the, 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 the voltage that comes in from across all these different neurons uh, crosses a certain threshold, uh, then you would elicit an action potential at what's called as the axonal initial segment, and that action potential would propagate uh, through this axon to reach to other neuronal dendrites that are present on the okay. So that's the, the general idea of how a neuron works. Uh, so these, uh, so the, the polarization comes from the fact that you observe these, uh, the flow of information uh, is unidirectional. Right? So you don't have a scenario where uh, information from the cell body 
is going into the dendrite cell, or you don't have information from the axon coming towards the cell body. So the, the flow of information is unidirectional. You always have uh, the dendrites receiving the inputs, uh, and they propagating uh, uh, the signal down the axon of three uh, once the threshold is crossed. So that's the law of dynamic uh, flow regulation. Now, so there is unidirectional flow of information. So based upon this simplified uh, a viewpoint of a neuron, now we need uh, uh, a neuronal model to be this simplified structure where you have uh, this. So the uh, the dendrites, uh, they should also be axons from some other neuron. So they should they will be receiving. So if you um, uh, zoom in on the dendrites, you would have these uh, little uh, structures that are making contact onto these dendrites. Uh, oh, okay. And these are axons from other neurons, basically. And right? so so you have axons from this neuron going and making contact to different dendrites uh, downstream. Uh, and here you have dendrites from and noxian axon terminals from other uh, neurons uh, coming and making contact to this particular structure. So what is the red thing there? The red thing is the cell body, and that is the reason why we have the, the threshold nonlinearity. Um, so the idea is that so we have this, the, the, the neuron is the whole thing actually. So this, oh, this entire thing, the, the, the dendrite, the axon, uh, the soma, or the cell body, um, the entire thing constitutes a single cell. So this is a single cell structure that uh, um, uh, receives information in its directory and it passes information to the cell body. And it would then propagate down the axonal structure uh, um, based upon uh, the information integration happening over here. Uh, so, so this entire thing is a neuron. Uh, and based upon this, we, uh, I mean, formulated this idea of neuron being a simple uh, uh, a summation uh, structure that's an algebraic sum of uh, whatever input that is coming onto this particular structure. Uh, and then these inputs, um, the, the different neurons that are making contact over here, x1, x2, x3, all of them are uh, represented as different inputs. Uh, and the weight corresponds to uh, the actual uh, uh, synaptic strength of this particular synapse that is present here, as well as the amount of attenuation that would be incurred uh, by this signal propagating along from here to here. And so that, all of that is uh, now put together into the single number, uh, which is the weight parameter that is shown over here. Uh, and the idea behind uh, uh, um, covered signal neural function was, was basically um, taken from Ramon Ikahal's ideas uh, of dynamic polarization. And you have this uh, weighted summation of the inputs, uh, and you can have the, the weights to be positive or negative, uh, accounting for excited here in the synapses. Uh, and that summation is fed into a threshold nonlinear. Right? So, so that's why this is the, the, the green part of it is uh, the algebraic sum, uh, and you have this. Uh, this threshold nonlinearity, which is represented by this function, uh, which is, uh, uh, I mean, typically a differentiable function, a sigmoid or something like that, which would uh, ensure that if the threshold crosses a certain value, then this neuron would elicit an action potential and it propagates the other pieces. Right? So, so below that, it is going to be zero or minus one, and above it, it is going to be one. Uh, and zero. So, that is the, the one corresponds to the fact that uh, there is going to be an action potential propagated. And so, so this was the simplest model for uh, a single neuron function. Uh, and in this simple neuron model, uh, if you see what all can change, uh, the, the majority thing that can change is the synapses. There's nothing else. Uh, the only other thing is the sigmoid. Uh, you could shift the threshold, you could change the slope of it, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I mean, instead of focusing on that, uh, the idea was that it was focused only on the uh, the uh, uh, the, the synaptic strength, which is W1, W2, Wn. Uh, and the idea was that that is how neurons learn. Uh, the cell basis for learning and memory. Whenever we learn new things, uh, the idea was that uh, these synaptic structures change, uh, and that is what is leading to whatever learning that we learn. So it was, it was postulated to be rooted in synaptic learning. So the idea behind the whole synaptic learning theory is that uh, 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 neurons are simple algebraic summation units. Uh, and synapses change in response to learning and form curative substrate for learning and memory. So that was the basic idea. Based upon this stuff, over the years, several kinds of learning rules have been proposed uh, to account for how exactly the synapses would change, uh, and they have been used in uh, explaining various different biological phenomena. And so, so the, the among the first ones is the is the covariance rule, which is an extension of uh, uh, F postulates basically. Yeah. And here you have the firing rate of neuron A and neuron B, and the change in the synaptic weight uh, is dependent upon the product or the correlation between uh, um, these two uh, firing rates, and there's a, a learning rate parameter that is present. Uh, and 
So, so and you have the, the BCM rule named after three different people, the uh, Vienna Stock Cooper and Munro. Um, and they propose this, and this particular rule is useful in understanding how exactly uh, uh, learning or uh, synaptic plasticity occurs uh, in hippocampal and particle neurons. Uh, and so you apply, uh, say, for instance, on the x axis, you could have uh, frequent, I mean, uh, stimuli of different frequencies. Uh, and for low frequency inputs, you would get long term depression or reduction in synaptic rate. So this is delta W. Uh, and for after threshold, uh, you would have an increase basically. Uh, so this was the BCM rule that was proposed. So this has, a, I mean, this has been extremely helpful in uh, in understanding the uh, synaptic plasticity in campus and models. So, so this is the self-organizing map, uh, and this is the, I mean, this is an example of uh, unsupervised learning structures. Uh, and this rule has been uh, uh, useful in uh, in understanding orientation selective columns in the context, uh, and direction selective columns uh, in the context. Uh, so what are these? Uh, so if you look at the, this, this is a map of the particle region now, and if you look at neurons in this particular pink region, let's say here, yeah, you would have neurons that are responding to one particular orientation, say zero degrees or 45 degrees. So, and I mean, the yellow would mean um, 45, like if, if pink means zero, yellow would mean 45, uh, um, yeah, I mean, blue would mean 90 and so on. So, so you have uh, different colored selectivity, uh, um, neurons with different selectivities of orientations uh, are distributed along the particle space uh, in such a fashion basically. And the, the governance rule is uh, extremely helpful in understanding these kinds of things. So that's another rule. That, and you also have the, the spike time independent plasticity rule. Instead of uh, um, I mean, uh, ignoring the, the time at which actual potentials are occurring, uh, you actually take the time into account uh, and ask with reference to the, so you have two neurons, let's say, and there's a presynaptic neuron which fires an action potential first, uh, and then there's a postsynaptic neuron which fires an action potential second. Uh, so if A follows B, then you would have a certain direction of synaptic change. Uh, and if on the other hand it's other way around, uh, you would have a synaptic change uh, on the other direction. Right? So, so this is uh, um, a scenario where the, the pre comes first and the post comes later. Uh, therefore, you have increase in the synaptic strength. Uh, here, on the other hand, this is reduced. So the idea is that you have so many different rules for, uh, for synaptic plasticity that have been proposed over the years. So, and with, with these kinds of uh, uh, main rules, uh, um, there have been several algorithms that have been uh, proposed for uh, uh, learning in these kind of networks. You could have a completely feed forward network uh, where there's a layered structure and you have hidden layers uh, and information from I mean, uh, propagation occurs from the input layer uh, to the output layer, and you would have uh, learning algorithms um, which would uh, allow for adjusting these synaptic weights um, and uh, 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 allow you to learn certain aspects of uh, the, the input that you need. You could have uh, completely feed forward structures, uh, or you could have recurrent structures like this, like the Hopkins network. Uh, and you could, uh, I mean, in all these scenarios, you're using simple neuronal structures like this. Right. So, so all these neurons are made up of uh, simple algebraic units for, followed by some kind of a threshold mark. And it has been very useful. Uh, I mean, nobody can question the, the utility of uh, these networks and uh, their uh, um, their uh, functions uh, or, I mean, how exactly they are useful in day-to-day -day applications. Uh, or even when, say, for instance, if uh, we do behavioral experiments uh, and if we want to track certain behavioral uh, properties of rats, uh, there are packages available for, uh, uh, for that which are based upon deep learning tools. Uh, and the rest of it is, uh, I mean, uh, urban level now, uh, urban level, real level. So, so you have these kinds of uh, uh, um, in networks that have been useful uh, for various different purposes. So, so that is not going to be the focus of my network. So that is utility of it, let's not discount it. Uh, um, so that is useful from the perspective of if you have a certain engineering application, mm -hmm. uh, and if you're interested in uh, uh, executing that, uh, and how is that an input output pattern to be executed? Uh, and if you have these quote unquote neuron like structures uh, with specific learning rules, uh, that is capable of providing you with uh, a network uh, which will learn that input output pattern to as much efficacy as you want. And that utility has been there. But so the, 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 the goal of my talk is not to question that utility. The utility of that is there from engineering application. Now, the goal of my talk is 
the um, the the question of whether the networks that we are building with these kinds of neurons uh, are they really representative of uh, the actual neurons and the network that is present in real uh, brain systems? So because uh, the whole inspiration for artificial neural networks and even the nomenclature uh, comes from real neurons. So that's the 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 cell. Uh, um, so the question is: Is that cell uh, um, really true? Um, if we study artificial neural networks, are we really studying the real thing? Now, is the kind of network that we are building here and analyzing here, uh, are they really models of the brain? Does uh, uh, studying artificial neural networks uh, provide any kind of understanding about the real thing? So that's one of the questions uh, that I'll ask in uh, this particular thing. Uh, so, so my perspective would be from the perspective of from the the idea of understanding uh, how exactly the brain functions uh, and what exactly it is doing uh, uh, when it is uh, executing certain functions. So that's the, the goal of uh, 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 my talk is here and that's where I'm going to talk. So, so when you compare the real neurons and the, um, real um, neurons or real networks and artificial neurons and artificial networks, uh, there are several ways of performing this comparison. And so one way of doing it would be Say that I mean, treat that treat the, the artificial neural networks as a black box, uh, treat the real brain as a black box, uh, and you say that I'm going to present uh, certain kind of inputs uh, to this particular structure uh, and ask questions about whether you have uh, uh, the, the outputs from the artificial network uh, and from the real network, are they going to be matching with each other? Uh, that's one way of doing it. Let's say, for instance, uh, the real brain has certain kind of illusions, the partial illusion, for instance. If you invert the phase of Margaret Thatcher uh, and you have uh, the eyes also inverted, when the phase is inverted, you don't see the fact that the, the eyes are inverted. But on the other hand, when it's uh, uh, rotated, uh, you realize that the, the eyes are inverted, which is less than the And you also have Weber's law. There are so many psychophysical laws that are present. Uh, and you can ask whether your deep neural networks uh, are obeying these laws. So you're still treating it as a black box, you're not uh, going into the mechanisms behind how exactly the artificial neural network is implemented uh, and uh, how the real brain is implemented. And so, so here you could compare it and uh, um, in, uh, um, my friend S.P. Arun named Center for Neuroscience, uh, he asks questions from this perspective. He takes uh, deep networks, uh, he takes real neurons uh, and asks questions about whether artificial neural networks do obey the law. Uh, can you see that illusion in uh, in uh, these kind of artificial neural networks. And as you would expect, the answer is kind of mixed. Right? So depending upon which neural network you choose, uh, they obey some of them, they don't obey another part of them. So, so you have different kinds of answers. For them. So that's not my way of looking at it. My way of looking at it is, uh, um, I mean, what exactly goes into the, the real neural network uh, and what exactly goes into the artificial network? What makes them? If I don't treat them as uh, black boxes, uh, I'm interested in the mechanisms behind how exactly the real brain implements it uh, and whether that mechanism is being used uh, by these kind of studies. So why is that essential? Uh, so I mean, this is an example, this is an example that Professor Shastri uh, in electrical engineering gave me like <laughs> almost two, three decades ago. Uh, so he, he made this point of why it is important to uh, look at mechanistic basis of uh, of uh, the brain and I mean if you are interested in understanding the brain you will have to ask if this kind of a uh, of an algorithm is implementable by the brain itself. So the example that he gave was uh, the distinction between an active laser scanner uh, for estimating the depth of different objects in this room uh, and how exactly the brain does it. So you might have built a system the active laser scanner uh, which is capable of finding out what exactly the depth of each and every pixel in this room is, uh, but that doesn't give you a model of the brain. Right? So if you treat it as a black box, uh, where this room is the input and the depth map is the output, uh, you have the active laser scanner also capable of doing what exactly you want. Uh, you also have the human brain capable of doing that. Display. But the mechanisms behind those two are completely different. Uh, and so, so just by building uh, a, a laser scanner, uh, you have not, you have gotten no information whatsoever about, about uh, how exactly the brain works. Uh, so therefore, the, the mechanistic basis becomes uh, important and that's the perspective uh, that I'm going to look at. In this narrative, 
where I mean from that perspective, but and in this narrative where we are talking about the neurons as algebraic uh, summation units uh, and uh, 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 they are capable of learning by synaptic uh, uh, learning, basically synaptic changes are the only things that are driving the learning. Yeah. It turned out later that we were driven by multiple force interpretation. So why did it have to be later? Why not earlier? Uh, so the, the idea is that as, as techniques became available for actually recording from this neural structure stuff, so we started recording from places which we were unable to record earlier and therefore the assumptions that we made earlier uh, became false one by one as time progressed. But, but unfortunately, the, the artificial neural network literature or the deep learning literature is still stuck in uh, um, that kind of neural uh, architecture with simple integrated and uh, fine kind of so, uh, so the first oversimplification that I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, with reference to neurons being the, first, the, the, the very I mean, basis of uh, how exactly neurons uh, function, basically. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's with reference to the, the very fact that we treat neurons as algebraic summation units for the threshold market. So, so the assumption here was that uh, the nonlinearity, which I will come to in a minute, uh, resides only at the cell body, and the rest of the neuron is just computing the, uh, an algebraic sum of whatever information that's coming into this particular cell. Uh, that was the idea. Right? So, so in reality, when people actually started recording from these structures, uh, it turned out that the nonlinearity is not just at the cell body, but it is expressed throughout the entire entity. Right? So, so to, for, for, for me to tell you what exactly this nonlinearity, I have to ask the question. What exactly is this nonlinearity? Yeah, it turns out it's the ability of this, this cell to generate action potential. So this is a recording from a hippocampal pyramidal neuron. Now, and what you're doing is you are injecting a, a current of 250 ampere into the cell. Now, so, and you are recording the voltage output. Now. So you're injecting current and you're recording the voltage output of this particular cell. Now, and you see that as long as the, I mean, um, uh, when you're injecting this, you see that it charges up like an RC circuit. Uh, and as long as it reaches this threshold value, it is basically uh, kind of going up as mass. If it never crossed this, uh, it would have just gone and settled down at a, at a steady state value, and that would be the end of it. But here, what has happened is uh, it has crossed this threshold value, and then it elicits this action for itself, typically a 100 millivolt signal uh, of 1 millisecond width. Uh, and that it, I mean, it, it automatically comes back to into wherever it was. So eventually, when you turn off the star, it will come back to the single minute potential, which is around minus 65, minus 7. So this is the threshold nonlinearity that we are talking about. Yeah. And so, so until this point, it's like an integrator that is integrating information. So this is a pulse term. Yeah. And therefore, you see this um, RC-like integration that's happening. On the other hand, if you have inputs that are synaptic in nature, yeah, that will be passed through an RC circuit. Yeah. And that would, I mean, eventually, if that crosses a certain threshold value, you would have a certain action potential. So that's the threshold, uh, uh, or that's the nonlinearity that we are talking about. Where does this nonlinearity come from? Uh, so it turns out it comes from um, these molecules uh, called as ion channels uh, that are present on the neural network. Now, right? so, so you have these ion, these ion channels are protein molecules uh, which are capable of passing specific ions uh, through this particular structure. Right. So, and if you look at the, the property of this particular channel that is present over here, let's say that this is a sodium channel, which means that uh, it would allow sodium, which is a positively charged ion, now, to pass through this particular structure and reach the inside of the neuron. The property of this particular molecule is that uh, it has a certain input output characteristics. The input output characteristics is that put voltage on the x axis, put the current through that particular channel on the y axis, uh, and it give you a signal. Right. So, so until a certain voltage, this ion channel does not open now. And after a certain voltage, uh, it starts opening and lets sodium to come inside. So that is what reflects us this nonlinearity over here. So this sigmoid uh, is basically reflective of uh, the ion channel that is present over here, uh, which has a nonlinear IV relationship. The current voltage relationship uh, is basically nonlinear. Uh, and therefore, once the voltage crosses this particular threshold, which is around minus 15 in this case, uh, you see that the sodium channels open and let sodium inside, giving you this huge influx of sodium into the cell. Uh, and eventually, potassium goes out and you have the action potential coming. 
But this nonlinearity is reflective of uh, the input output characteristic of this single molecule that is present. There are several such uh, sodium channels that are present throughout the entire structure. Uh, and that nonlinearity is what reflects us uh, the action potential. So when we say that you have input information coming onto this particular structure, uh, and when it crosses a certain threshold, you have an action potential. Uh, what mediates it uh, is these kinds of ion channels that are present. So the assumption was that uh, in from Ramon Kahal's time, uh, the assumption was that this particular nonlinearity was present only at the cell body, and that is where the action potential is initiated. Uh, and it goes across this entire structure. Right? So, so why did we assume that? Because we did not have the capability to record from these thin structures. So, so at the cell body, this is around 10 to 20 microns. So it is easier to relatively easier to record from the cell body. Yeah. On the other hand, as you go into dendrites, um, so this is on the order of three microns. Um, as you go to more thinner dendrites, it becomes like uh, one micron basically. And right? so, so you have this kind of a structure. Uh, and I mean, until the, uh, the early 90s, uh, we were unable to record from these neural structures. Uh, and therefore, we assumed that uh, the only things that were present over there were the synaptic inputs that are coming up. And it is just filtering and sending it down to the cell volumes. But when we started recording from these places, uh, it was clear uh, that there are ion channels present uh, throughout this entire structure. Uh, so the sodium channel density, for instance, uh, in the camera and quantum neurons, uh, is almost the same from the cell body throughout this entire dendritic structure. Right? So, and uh, uh, and there were certain ion channels uh, uh, which were present at higher density in the dendrites compared to the cell body. Yeah. So this is the channel that we will keep coming back to. This is HCM. This is the pacemaker channel uh, which is also present in the heart uh, and is responsible for the pacemaking uh, activity. Yeah. And that's, that's why it's called the case making channel. We just remember HCN uh, um, and we will come back to this uh, uh, again and again. And so, so it's, it's, it, it was now clear based upon these I mean, painful recordings which were performed uh, throughout the genetic structure uh, that these nonlinearities are not just present at the cell body, they are present throughout the entire area. So, so the, 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 the dendrites which express these active ion channels. Uh, have been since called as active dendrites as opposed to passive dendrites, uh, which did not have these active mechanisms. By active mechanism, I mean uh, anything which has a nonlinear idealization. So, as um, so a consequence of this, over the years, uh, people have found that uh, um, this results in several properties uh, of, uh, of neurons which were not even assumed at one point of time because they were thought to be uh, passive in nature, the, the generic structures. Uh, so the first thing was that uh, now information flow becomes bidirectional because if we have sodium channels here, there is nothing stopping an action potential that is initiated over here to go all the way down into the dendrite. Right? So, right? so, so information flow is not unidirectional anymore. It is bidirectional. You can have uh, the uh, the action potential uh, uh, propagating from the cell body into the dendrite. Right? Uh, so you can also have the back propagating action. But this is nothing to do with the back propagation algorithm. Uh, so the amplitude of the back propagating action potentials is greater than uh, not all of So one of the assumptions that we had earlier uh, was that action potentials are all of So you can have them at zero millivolts or 100 millivolts. You can't have an action potential at uh, 10 millivolts, 20 millivolts. Uh, with this kind of a scenario, you can record action potentials at different points at uh, different values, like say five millivolts, 10 millivolts, whatnot. Uh, and because the sodium channels are now present in the dendrites, the special nature of this particular structure to be able to elicit action potential is now gone. Any part of the dendrite can elicit action potentials. So you can have uh, the dendritic spikes initiated at any point because it is driven by the sodium channels. Uh, and I mean, they are not exclusive only to the cell body. So therefore, they can initiate at any place. In the cell. So, so therefore, it becomes very, very clear that uh, the kind of uh, uh, processing that can happen over here is uh, uh, very different. And I mean, over the years, I mean, the, 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 the algebraic sum plus threshold nonlinearity is the simplified version of an integrated fire. Uh, and the integrate part uh, does the low pass filtering. And that's what uh, we assume the uh, function to be. Uh, but now, because of the presence of the pacemaker channel that I was mentioning, uh, you can have uh, um, neurons acting as bad pass filters. Uh, and you can have. Uh, Different parts of the neurons manifest different kinds of uh, different density of that particular channel. Uh, 
and therefore you can have this part of the dendrite uh, respond maximally to let's say 12 hertz uh, and this part of the neuron responding maximally to 4 hertz so you have a kind of filter back uh, where the inputs uh, to different parts of this particular dendritic structure are uh, filtered at different bands uh, and therefore it is not just simply funneling information to the cell body and making it cross the threshold uh, or I mean looking for whether it is crossing the threshold uh, you have a scenario where it is actively filtering information and then passing it on. Right? So, so the kind of processing that happens in a single neuron are much more than uh, uh, what was thought of. So, so the internally is set, the narrative with some of the work that we have done in our own laboratory uh, and uh, you know, over the years we have worked on that. So the sigmoid model will not hold anymore? A single sigmoid model will not hold anymore. So, uh, so if, you are, if you are interested in modeling real neurons, uh, uh, I'll, I'll complete in a minute. Uh, I'll show that. Uh, I mean, you'll see the complexity that is uh, associated with it. So we have uh, worked on, I mean, our lab mostly focuses on um, cellular neurophysiology, looking at individual neurons. Uh, and we ask questions about uh, how exactly uh, things go on here. Uh, we dive a little bit at network scale and molecular scale as well. Uh, and they have shown that the presence of active dendrites uh, affects uh, uh, I mean processing at network scale, cellular scale, uh, and molecular scale, uh, uh, different studies, uh, different people uh, over the years. So, so, um, so, 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 so in summary, for this particular oversimplification, this was the assumption that we had, that information flow is unidirectional, that there is a single threshold nonlinearity here, and then it passes over here, basically. With the presence of active dendrites, uh, the layer of the nonlinearity is present throughout the entire structure, uh, Information flow is bidirectional. You can have action potential in the cell genetic spike initiated in any of these dendrites. And I mean, um, because of that, you will have strong interactions between the output of the neuron and the inputs that are coming on to this particular structure. So, so to your question, uh, um, what exactly is the complexity of an uh, individual neuron in, in the context or in the hippocampus? So, this is a paper that came out uh, last year. Uh, so, what they did was uh, they looked at um, all the inputs that, uh, that are coming on to a single neuron, some 10,000, 20,000 inputs. Uh, and they had a train of action potential generated at the cell body, basically. And that particular neuron was endowed with all the, um, the ion channels that were present. Uh, and when they had that particular neuron, uh, and they wanted to ask, question, ask the, the question was, uh, what kind of an artificial system will be able to replicate this input output character? 20,000 inputs, dynamical inputs coming on that particular sector. The action potential output is also going to be uh, in uh, dynamical. So now the question is, uh, what kind of uh, uh, artificial structure uh, would be able to approximate the single neuron uh, structure that is here? Uh, so they found that a uh, single plus neuron couldn't do it, obviously. Yeah. So they found that they required a deep neural network uh, for approximating the function of a single particle. Uh, right? So so a deep neural network is not a model for a neural network in the brain. It's a model for a single neuron in the brain. Actually. Right? So, so that's the kind of complexity that we are dealing with. Uh, and I mean, when they, um, um, I mean, if you had a simple passive structure like this, uh, then yes, this perceptron would have been ideal to model this kind of structure. Uh, but uh, there are several lines of evidence, including the most recent one. Yes, this one, uh, which show that uh, the complexity of the processing power of a single neuron uh, is equivalent to a deep neural structure, uh, not necessarily a uh, person from this. So these are other review papers, uh, which if you uh, are, I'll, I'll make the slide is anyway here, I'll also send it to the uh, and then you can get this slide. So there are several other reviews which talk about how to uh, draw inspiration from biological dendrites and their active properties uh, to empower uh, uh, artificial neural networks. Uh, so that is uh, uh, so is there any interesting idea that I mean, to me uh, one of the conclusions seems like we can probably get away with this bad assumption with a deep neural network. Uh, so maybe we can get away this what looks like the message. Uh, but uh, if you really have to uh, model say multiple uh, neurons or whatever, then the only option now seems to be deep, deep, deep sort of thing. Deepest possible. <laughs> yes. So I mean, is there any any other smarter way of uh, 
So I mean, people, uh, these papers will tell you uh, the different ways by which people are trying to incorporate these into real, uh, uh, in real network architecture stuff. And it seems like, I mean, this is just the first oversimplification that we are talking about. Uh, uh, we'll come back to this question uh, towards the end of it again if, uh, uh, when we uh, I mean, summarize all the oversimplification stuff. But the point that I'm interested in making is that uh, this assumption that, I mean, we can uh, model a neuron or call this as a neuron is, is, is an extreme oversimplification. So, so when, uh, when, when uh, uh, the artificial neural network validated things of, uh, uh, these neural networks as models for brain networks at different parts of the brain. Now, that seems to be not, there seems not to be the case because uh, even for modeling a single neuron, uh, you would require uh, an entire deep network. And uh, in the same group uh, as an uh, article in uh, BioArchive or the Archive, uh, where they presented the NIST database to a single neuron, uh, trained it basically, a single, single, um, this kind of a neuron basically. Uh, and train it and show that uh, a single neuron is capable of performing the uh, classification. So, so the complexity is uh, is much much higher uh, than uh, what we thought it would be based upon assumptions which were made at a time when real recordings were not possible. So this is the early nineties. Uh, so this is the first oversimplification. Yeah, the spiking behavior. The spiking behavior can occur in the dendrites itself. Uh, so you can have uh, dendritic spikes some uh, at uh, and you could also have uh, action potentials initiated here, which would go downstream. Uh, and it also turns out uh, that the dynamic spikes and the backdrop giving action potentials that come in over here uh, can also release certain kind of molecules from the dendrites, uh, which can go and affect the other neurons that are present surrounding uh, the surrounding location. Uh, and so it's not, uh, this is not the only mode of communication, basically. Yeah, you have uh, uh, other modes of communication because of. Uh, the spikes being generated there itself, uh, or the color of the backdrop being generated. So, yes. So, I mean, this, uh, we normally think of neural networks as continuous signals, right? Yeah. But then the real neuron, I mean, it's, a, uh, it's a spike train. It's a spike train, yes. Right. Yeah. So, how does that make a difference in terms of? So, I mean, so you can you can model that uh, neurons are spiking neural networks also if you have like integrated higher back. Structures uh, which give you the actual spike timings also. So, I mean, the rate based model uh, uh, is just a continuous version of uh, uh, what you have in a spike uh, train network. Uh. And the idea is that you would have uh, each of these inputs that are coming out of this particular structure will have different spike trains. Uh, and the integration would happen on the postsynaptic side, depending upon whether this is HNAT or inhibitory, you would get uh, uh, deflections which are positive or negative. Uh, and that integration would be happen on the post synaptic side. So in the earlier model, that integration would happen only at the cell body, and it crosses the threshold at the uh, action potential. Here, on the other hand, every branch has its own, um, I mean, uh, local integration unit, and that's why, I mean, if you want an approximation of what a perceptron is in the real uh, neuron, so this would be one perceptron. Right? So because you here itself, you have a, a threshold normally cavity. Yeah. And that is being propagated down here. So, so that this is like the second layer, and therefore you have each of these acting as uh, different layers, some, uh, and the information propagates. And here you also have interactions, right? So, when the signal that is coming in from here, some of it will flow through the set, some of this will flow through the set, and therefore there will be interactions between synapses here and synapses here, which is not account for this kind of a linear structure. Uh, so, you will have connections there also. So, that's why you need an entire deep network for. For modeling uh, a single neuron. Uh, so, so that's where that idea came from uh, that you need an entire neuron network for uh, uh, modeling a single person. So, so the second uh, uh, assumption that we made, uh, uh, the second oversimplification that we made uh, over the years uh, is that uh, uh, neural circuits are made of uh, repeating homogeneous computational neurons. So, a person from in a, in a deep neural network, uh, one perceptron is not any different from any other. Uh, so they are all exactly the same. And the even brain was assumed to be performing some kind of uh, a similar kind of structure. Uh, so where the, I mean, if one, one, one neuron is replaceable by the other, uh, and they are exactly the same, there is no difference between them. Uh, in reality, if you look at it, uh, uh, there are significant neural circuit heterogeneities that are manifested. Uh, uh, I'll come to what these are in a minute. So there are different forms and they have to be accounted for. I will also tell you why they should be accounted for uh, and why we can't simply uh, ignore them. So, so 
So these are examples uh, uh, that part is not very clear, but uh, so you have uh, these are two different kinds of uh, uh, two different brain regions. Dendritic uh, virus is one of them. Uh, CA1 is another. Uh, so these are one kind of neuron. Uh, these are other kind of neurons. So this is more visible. You can see that these two neurons are very very different in terms of morphology. Okay? So so you have the cell body here. Uh, the dendritic structure is much more organized here. Here on the other hand, you have fewer dendritic. So these are adjacent to each other in terms of brain regions, but you have uh, uh, them uh, uh, having very distinct uh, uh, mean morphological structures. Uh, and even within the same type of neurons, uh, you see that the organization can be very, very different. Uh, so some of them have more branches, some of them have lesser branches. Uh, so you have very, very different kinds of morphology that is present over there. This will be structural uh, heterogeneity. Right? So, so even within a given structure, uh, given brain region, uh, the neurons have very, very different kinds of structures. So, and, uh, and coming to functional uh, heterogeneity, so this is how um, uh, neurons look like under a light cell microscope. Uh, so you have a glass electrode that is present. Uh, and I mean, each of them is a cell body. Basically. You don't even see that. Right? So, so I mean, uh, uh, that's 10 microns, uh, and that's the kind of cell that you have a glass electrode that is being put in. Uh, and you're recording from the old ACP. So, two of the time we have done in now. And you see that the neuron responds by a firing frequency of 26 hertz. So, right? so, so now let's say that you pass on to uh, this process is called a patching. Right? Uh, you pass on to another uh, neuron that is adjacent to this. Uh, you inject the same 250 time we have done And now you expect that that is also going to fire 26 hertz uh, action potential. That will be the case. You would have something like this. Uh, some cells won't even fire. So this is for 250 times here. Right? So some cells don't even fire action potentials for 250 times here. So some cells fire like the 40 hertz, uh, uh, 40 action potentials within the same period. Uh, um, and then on the other hand, certain others have like 50, 20, 26, uh, and so on. Right? So this is functional. Even with the same synaptic inputs coming onto the structure, structure the, the output is going to be very, very different. Across different neurons, so that's a functional heterogeneity. So, so there are several such heterogeneities. So, the structure is one part of it that I mentioned, where neurons are either smaller or bigger, you have intrinsic, like what I showed you just now, where the firing properties are different, the firing rates are different. You can also have synaptic heterogeneities, where one synaptic strength is higher, another one is lower, and so on. So, so these are all local circuit heterogeneities. You also have heterogeneity in terms of what comes into this particular neural circuit. Right? So this is a scenario where there are inputs, uh, and I mean there are there is a network, uh, um, and all the neurons in this particular network uh, are getting exactly the same input, basically. Right? So there is no difference in terms of what kind of inputs are getting, coming in. Uh, on the other hand, in reality, even though they are getting inputs from um, um, other brain regions, uh, each and every neuron will get very different inputs. Basically. So that is apparently. So you may say, oh, well, I mean, there is heterogeneity. Maybe this measurement error, why don't we just leave it? Uh, take the average, put it there, and be happy with it. Uh, turns out you can't do that uh, because these heterogeneities uh, seem to have real functions. So one of the, uh, the postulated functions of the dendritic virus uh, uh, is what is I mean, uh, called as uh, pattern separation or decorrelation. So you have two similar patterns coming on to the uh, particular structure, two different cases in this case. Uh, so the inputs are very similar, but the outputs are very dissimilar. So you are decorrelating uh, the inputs that are coming on to this particular structure. Right? So, so that is decorrelation, and this would be called a sub pattern decorrelation. Uh, so you are trying to decorrelate uh, the inputs that are coming on to that particular structure. It turns out uh, that if you have uh, uh, a homogeneous circuit, uh, right? so similar to what I showed you here, uh, so a homogeneous circuit uh, receiving identical inputs like this, uh, right? uh, the output uh, is if you, if you compute correlation between uh, the, the, the output correlation basically across different neurons, uh, you see that they are close to one. There is no decorrelation whatsoever. Uh, but on the other hand, if you start introducing uh, heterogeneities one by one, intrinsic synaptic, uh, uh, structural, and afferent heterogeneities, uh, you see that uh, you now, even though the inputs are identical to each other, uh, you now start having decorrelation in terms of what exactly. And that is contributed by uh, the differences that these cells have in themselves. Uh, so you have different cells having different threshold values, different firing rate values. Uh, 
and so on and so forth. And as a consequence of that, they respond differently. And as a consequence of that, that you would have a scenario where even though the inputs are similar, you would have decorrelation in the output. So, so the heterogeneities can play a role in, uh, in decorrelating the inputs. Uh, different kinds of heterogeneities can come together to do that. Uh, and you also have a scenario where if you have these heterogeneities, so this is the scenario, what is shown over here is that uh, you are perturbing the network with different kinds of perturbations. Uh, so let's not get into details of what exactly these are. Uh, and you are measuring the amount of change in the output uh, correlation basically. Right? So, so in the absence of structural heterogeneity, you see that the amount of perturbation is relatively large. Right? So you have uh, a scenario where it is going from say 100 percentage to minus 65 or something like that. Now, here on the other hand, when you have a network that is endowed with structural heterogeneity, so the amount of perturbation, the amount of uh, changes uh, that you obtain uh, with the same perturbations are much lesser compared to what so the presence of these uh, heterogeneities uh, enhance the functional resilience uh, of these uh, uh, neural circuits. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not something that you can simply ignore. So one question. Yeah. So suppose we think of a regular neural network, so several layers, and uh, maybe the input layer, let's say neurons, uh, it has, it assumes certain type of input. There is some other la uh, later layer, will assume some other type of input. Right, its response will be different. These two inputs. Uh, is it something uh, that would be synaptic heterogeneity? Right? So, so are you one point synaptic heterogeneity or apparent heterogeneity or compound? It's a synaptic heterogeneity mostly because you are talking about local circuit uh, in that particular circuit. What's happening? So, so that would be synaptic heterogeneity. On the other hand, you wouldn't have accounted for intrinsic heterogeneity. And uh, I mean, say for instance, if you have uh, scenarios, I mean, extreme uh, reductionism. If you think of uh, 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 let's say the same integrating bias structure, let's say, just as the nonlinearity is such that your threshold is now not fixed at one particular value, you have the sigmoids uh, uh, slope as well as the position, the half maximum point, uh, keep shifting towards left and right. Uh, so that would be one way of accounting for it. But as I said, uh, when you talk about intrinsic properties, you will also have to account for all the dynamic properties that I talked about in the previous uh, uh, oversimplification. So, say lambda account for bandpass material, lambda account for dynamic spikes, uh, lambda account for uh, all the different things that are consequent to the active network. So, and all of them will show heterogeneity between neuron X and neuron Y. So, that would be what intrinsic heterogeneity and structural heterogeneity, of course, would affect uh, how different synapses under the same neuron interact with each other. Uh, and so, so, all that would uh, bring in additional layers of complexity uh, into how exactly this uh, uh, functions as well as in terms of uh, whether that is useful in performing real functions. So, so that's one example of where the heterogeneity is useful. Uh, I'll show you another example uh, of what happens if you have, uh, uh, if you break the assumption of uh, uh, homogeneous repeating units. Uh, so, so this is uh, um, uh, this is Moses uh, and John O'Keefe who got their Nobel in 2014 for their discoveries of cells that constitute a positioning system in the brain. Right? So, so of the two, the, the, uh, John O'Keefe who got his uh, Nobel for uh, the discovery of what are called the place cells, which are present in the campus. Uh, and the Moses got their Nobel for uh, the grid cells in, in the environment. So what are these grid cells? So what is shown over here uh, is a two meter by two meter arena. It's a box basically. Yeah. And you have uh, an animal that is running in this particular structure. Right? So the, the black uh, uh, wiggly lines um, are an animal running around this particular structure. Uh, right? uh, and as the animal is running around, what they are doing is they are recording from a single neuron or they are recording the action potential outputs of a single neuron basically in, the, in a structure called a sacral complex. Uh, right? uh, and now you observe that uh, the action potentials are not observed, I mean, at all places across the arena. The action potentials are observed only at specific locations as the animal traverses either this location or this location or this location and so on and so forth. You have uh, that particular cell eliciting action potential. You can compute the firing rate of this particular neuron uh, and plot that. Uh, right, uh, red means high firing rate, uh, blue means low firing rate. Uh, and you see that this neuron fires at specific locations. And if you uh, link them, it forms a kind of tessellation. Uh, exceptional tessellation of the entire arena. Right? So, so it's tessellating the entire arena in a exceptional manner. Uh, 
and therefore high signal are I mean equal to triangular the power you want to them and therefore they are called this grid sets they're being grid out of uh, the real world uh, and that is what is uh, um, um, uh, what that's what these grid sets are doing so so ever since they uh, found these kinds of uh, cells uh, in the early 2000s, uh, um, there has been interest in modeling these kinds of, uh, of networks. Uh, and one of the theoretical frameworks that has been used uh, kind of originates from uh, Hoffield's uh, uh, ideas of, uh, of from the Ising model. Uh, and you have this continuous attraction models for grid cells uh, as a model for how exactly this would be emerging because of interaction between cells that are present over there. So this is a model uh, and you see that here also you see this grid pattern uh, activity in these kinds of cells. However, if you look at the that particular paper, you will see that I mean they assume that the neurons in that particular network are repeating homogeneous units, integrating fine units. So they don't account for the fact that a um, there are heterogeneities in these neural circuits, uh, different kinds of heterogeneities, and b that they are not integrating fire, uh, they do have these kind of band bus filters. So here, what um, Divyant asked was, uh, um, he introduced one by one, uh, systematically introduced different kinds of heterogeneity that I talked about, uh, intrinsic heterogeneity, apparent heterogeneity, synaptic heterogeneity into these kinds of networks in different degrees, basically, because uh, uh, I mean, he wanted it to be systematic. So, so if you look at the, the initial part of it, you see that, I mean, all of them are showing nice grid pattern firing, basically. So there is no uh, problem here. But, but as you increase the heterogeneity, in the, in the effort, especially in apparent and uh, synaptic heterogeneity, you see that the grid pattern firing is completely wrong. Right? So, so if you if you actually introduce the kind of heterogeneity that are present in real neural structures, uh, you see that the model falls apart. You don't have a scenario, you don't have uh, the grid pattern activity that is uh, promised. Uh, and if you introduce all the heterogeneities to the grid, uh, there also you have a scenario where it is completely gone. So, I mean. So here's the scenario where if you take that assumption that uh, um, the, the, the brain is made of repeating homogeneous units, uh, the, the basic function of that particular network is kind of gone out. So how do you rectify this? Uh, so what Williams did was uh, he analyzed the activity and I mean of, of heterogeneous neural networks uh, and the homogeneous neural networks and asked what exactly is happening to the activity. Right? So this is the part spectrum. Uh, uh, and the comparison of uh, where exactly the perturbations are uh, from the homogeneous structures uh, with reference to different degrees of integrity. Right? So, so you observe that there is no perturbation whatsoever in the higher frequency. Most of the perturbations are in the lower frequency of activity. Right? So, so and the amount of heterogeneity, amount of uh, 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 perturbation is basically increasing uh, with the increasing degree of uh, uh, heterogeneity. So, right? so, so he postulated that so based upon these observations, he postulated that okay, if I find a mechanism to suppress the lower frequency activity, then I should be able to get back to grid pattern right? So, so the biological way of doing that uh, is to introduce uh, um, uh, in resonance uh, into this particular circuit. As I said, uh, under I mean, if you if you consider a neuron without these kind of pacemaker ion channels, it would be a low pass filter. Basically, the Lorentz shape now. Right? Uh, and you would have a kind of uh, uh, response uh, that would be uh, similar to 1 over f. Right? So, so now, if you have uh, uh, an additional pacemaker channel like what I was mentioning, the HCM channel that I was mentioning, uh, you would have low frequency suppressed uh, as a consequence of their presence. Uh, so these channels act like inductors. They are phenomenologically uh, acting as, and therefore, I mean, the RC is present naturally in the neuron. Uh, uh, this provides the L, and therefore you get this RLC circuit eventually giving you this uh, 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 filtering property. So, so he, he wanted to introduce this into the, the rate based models that he has. <laughs> Going back to control systems, so, because that's where everything started from. Uh, so, so he introduced this, uh, this uh, uh, resonance property into a neuron. So, this was the integrated neuron that we started out with. Uh, right? uh, what these neurons, what these ion channels do is that. Uh, they introduce the slow negative feedback loop. Uh, so this is a slow negative feedback loop, uh, which comes back and integrates over here. And because they are slow, they will be able to suppress only lower frequencies, uh, and they will not be able to suppress the higher frequencies. Why don't they suppress? Uh, because they have negative feedback. Uh, uh, and therefore, they will be able to suppress low frequency inputs, but not the higher frequency ones. Uh, 
and therefore you would get resonance sum. So this is the integrated neuron which gives you that uh, RC kind of a response sum. And here you are introducing this uh, additional uh, uh, negative feedback loop, uh, and that gives you this kind of a resonating structure. Uh, right, uh. And he also wanted to make sure that um, it was because of resonance and not because of the specific way he was using to introduce resonance sum. So what he did was he just introduced resonance in another way by introducing an artificial high-pass filter uh, and getting artificial resonance out of this particular circuit. Uh, lo and behold, uh, uh, if you had integrators, you saw that the grid pattern activity was gone. Uh, but now if you have resonating neurons, because you are now suppressing the lower frequency perturbations, uh, you see that uh, the, the grid pattern activity is intact, uh, even in the presence of this so, right? so, so if you account for all the biological features associated with it, uh, in terms of the band bus structure, in terms of the heterogeneity that are present, you're still able to get it. Uh, um, and that's why it's important to make sure that all of them. So over the years, we have worked on uh, different aspects of uh, heterogeneity uh, and how exactly they contribute to um, neural function across different brains. Our, our lab mostly works on the hippocampus and the entrenal cortex. So, so over the years, we have uh, uh, I mean, looked at different uh, functions of it. And from, from uh, I mean, uh, an artificial learning perspective as well, this paper came out last year but, uh, from somebody else, uh, not us. Uh, so here, they what they did was uh, they, um, I mean, introduced heterogeneities uh, into an uh, artificial neural network. Uh, and showed that learning with heterogeneity was more stable and robust, uh, particularly tasked with a rich temporal structure. Uh, and so it's important to uh, ensure that heterogeneities are accounted for uh, and not just ignored. Uh, um, I mean, neurons are not repeating homogeneous uh, uh, units, and therefore it's important to account for. Second, uh, the third overall simplification that we need, uh, um, because mostly of uh, the fact that we assume neurons to be integrated in higher structures uh, is uh, the uh, the idea that learning is accomplished uh, exclusively through synaptic changes. In that simple model, uh, we did not have anything else to change, uh, and therefore we assumed that uh, that is the only place that it could change. Uh, but in reality, uh, plasticity is ubiquitous. Anything that you can record in in from uh, from the biological system uh, is capable of change. So all the things that I talked about, uh, the bandpass filter, the frequency at which it is filtering, that can change. Uh, right? So the threshold of the action potential, that can change. Uh, the backpropagating action potential, that can change. The ability of the dendrite to spike, uh, that can change. How much speed does the action potential propagate? Uh, that can also change because you can change the myelin uh, that is associated with it. So everything that is present in the biological system can undergo change. Synapses happen to be just one of those several. And so, so it's important to uh, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so, and it's not something which is new, unfortunately, um, because of uh, I mean, uh, how uh, uh, the, the history of neuroscience, if you will, uh, it all started. Uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, as though all of it started from from health posturing uh, and neurons that fire together, wire together, and those notions uh, basically sent us down this rabbit hole. Uh, Without realizing that we are ignoring so many other things, and we did not even measure things. And even when things were measured and reported, that people just ignored and went with the first thing that they caught hold of, uh, and they assumed that the other things were not. And so this is the first test of uh, uh, of uh, uh, postulate uh, uh, in 1970. Yeah, this was the first time that synaptic potentiation was shown that you can introduce synaptic changes uh, in neurons. Uh, it was shown for the first time. Uh, right. So there, in the abstract, uh, not even deep in the paper, uh, there is this paper, uh, this uh, sentence, uh, which says that there are two independent mechanisms that are responsible for this. Uh, one is an increase in the efficiency of synaptic transmission at the perforant part synapses, which is what the literature went to, synaptic plasticity, synaptic plasticity, and only synaptic plasticity. And the second one is also reported here that uh, an increase in the excitability of the glandular cell population. What do I mean by excitability? It's the ability of glandular cells to generate action potential. For the exact same input stuff, if the neuron fires more number of action potential, then it becomes more excitable. If on the other hand, it fires lesser number of action potential, it will become less excitable. So here it was reported there, and we also, uh, I mean, kind of speculated uh, that it could be mechanisms that control threshold. Uh, 
that would be changing as a consequence of that. Uh, this is way back in 1973. Uh, and despite that, as I said, uh, uh, people just took one of those uh, and followed that and said that, okay, synapses are the only things that change. Uh, and that also needs to change. Okay? So this is uh, from our own review in 1973, yeah, where uh, um, um, we, uh, so this shows that, uh, I mean, localized synaptic plasticity, of course, is one way of achieving learning. Uh, but that's not the only thing. You can have structural plasticity, you can have the structure of uh, the spines and the synapses changing. Uh, you can also have localized intrinsic properties uh, changing. Uh, right? So, say for instance, the ability of this particular dendrite uh, to generate uh, dendritic spine that can change. Uh, right? uh, and you can also have global changes uh, where uh, when the, the neuron that is more excitable becomes less excitable and vice versa. All of that can happen simultaneously. It's not like uh, there is only one of them that is changing. So, so you have all of them happening at the same time. So here we argue that uh, you could achieve stable continuous learning through, uh, I mean, several of them I mean, coming together and changing at the same time. But it doesn't mean that uh, they're changing randomly. Right? So if you take the, the space of all possible plasticities, of, of all possible components of the n-dimensional space, so this falls in a kind of manifold, a low-dimensional manifold, where these things would fall, and therefore these are structured basically. So it can't be like, uh, oh, some random thing happens here, some other random thing happens here. But they all are interconnected to each other, uh, and that is what eventually leads to learning. So, so that's important to keep in mind. And uh, again, um, we have worked on these kinds of non-synaptic plasticity over the years uh, and showed that they do exist in, uh, in uh, different parts of the hippocampus. Uh, uh, so that is that. There are several review papers uh, on this as well, uh, uh, showing that uh, plasticity should not be considered only uh, synaptic in nature. Uh, and, how do you know that space is a small dimensional manifold? So because you have in specific neurons, uh, say for instance, if the synapses change towards a positive direction, now, you will have uh, some of this, the, the channels can change, uh, and you would have these channels changing in specific direction. How does that come about? Uh, so all of these are because of biochemical reactions. So once there is an activity pattern that is coming on to a structure due to whatever external stimulus that is coming on, now that goes and activates the biochemical signaling cascade. Right? So, so that biochemical signaling cascade has specific effects uh, on the synaptic receptors, uh, on the ion channels, uh, on the different parts of the neurons. Uh, and for a given neuron, it is fixed selective. So you can't have uh, the same signaling cascade reducing synaptic plasticity and increasing ion channel one. Now, you will have specific direction. If this goes up, this has to come down. So it is linked at the molecular level. Now, and that is what gives that low dimensional manifold. So, so over the years, I mean, as you can see, the, the, the range of years is all over the place. Uh, but I'm sure you have not heard about, uh, heard about these, uh, these different uh, um, things that are changing in response to activity patterns. Uh, and that synaptic plasticity is not the only show in town. Now, is not something which has not percolated into the um, uh, uh, into the AI community. Um, but I mean, if this is the power of a neuron that you're dealing with, uh, and if the artificial neural network community is still stuck with the puzzle from now, uh, then I mean, there's so much loss basically. Right? So, so biology, I mean, as you can see, is way ahead, uh, and the kind of AI is still in the 80s, uh, trying to use the same backpropagation algorithm for. Uh, for, uh, um, I mean, adjusting synapses, where in reality the neuron itself is so complex uh, and the learning rules can include various different things uh, beyond synapses. Uh, so I think it's time that the artificial neural network community kind of catches up. So, so then the, um, the fourth oversimplification is something that, uh, um, that uh, is, uh, is, it comes from kind of thinking of. Um, biology as uh, extensions of uh, Newtonian dynamics. Okay. So, so simplified uh, mean x leads to y, causality, one-to-one -one matrix. Uh, so v is equal to u plus a t and nothing else. Uh, so I mean, it, 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 I'm not, I mean, I wouldn't say uh, extrapolation from physics uh, because I mean, a quantum physicist would look at biology and say that this is so simple. And so, so I wouldn't say, that's why I'm saying I mean, <laughs> Newtonian dynamics and uh, that is where some of our thinking uh, comes from. Uh, and parsimony seems to be the solution. The simplest possible explanation is the one that helps you in understanding biology parsimony. Right? So, 
because the assumption that we make is that there is only one solution. There is a unique solution to how we can actually biological system accomplish learning. And our goal is to find that solution. That seems to be our way of thinking. Fortunately or unfortunately, biological systems express what is called as degeneracy across all systems. So that's a new term that I'm introducing. So I have to explain to you what that is. Degeneracy has uh, nothing to do with uh, uh, mathematical degeneracy of matrices or with uh, degenerates uh, or with degenerative disorders. Uh, it's a very fundamental biological concept. Uh, so um, this is Gerald Edelman, who uh, uh, got his Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology and Medicine in 1972 for uh, chemical structure of antibodies. So immunology you know, uh, uh, like many other Nobel Prize winners, uh, he switched over to neuroscience after his Nobel Prize. Uh, I mean, Gerald uh, Edelman, Sushma Ponekawa, uh, Francis Crick, uh, Leon Cooper. Uh, there are several names in which we show what we have after they have known that. And he wrote this uh, uh, a very, very influential review in 2001 uh, about degeneracy and complexity in biological systems. Okay, so that's the reason why he is there. Uh, okay, so, so this is a very important review. And I, I mean, the strongest attempt that I would read this uh, uh, only in uh, six pages, uh, but it, it, it it kind of changes the way I think about biology. Right? So it changes the way of thinking about biology as one to one mappings between uh, between neurons and behavior, or uh, uh, there's a unique solution to achieving this and things like that. Uh, so, and uh, so as I said, degeneracy is a fundamental biological concept. Uh, so, so it's the ability of elements that are structurally different uh, to perform the same function or even the same function. So that's the the key phrase here is structurally different. It's not redundancy because uh, redundancy would be where uh, uh, the same function is performed by identical elements. I mean, say for instance, if this stops working, I just remove the A batteries, uh, triple A batteries, uh, put another set of triple A batteries, and it's transferred. That is redundancy. On the other hand, uh, I use a pen for pointing at this instead of that would be degenerates. So I have structurally distinct elements uh, uh, capable of doing the same function. Now, so, and it involves structural different males, same or other functions, different functions. But here are some examples. So, uh, so if you read through this, you will see that uh, the examples span all the way from behavior. So this is uh, the behavioral end where you are talking about the in terms of inter-animal communication. There are large, sometimes nearly infinite number of ways to transmit the same message, uh, a situation most obvious in language. So you can have uh, uh, different uh, things, behavioral repertoires. Uh, and at this end of it, you have the genetic code, protein code, and so on and so forth. So across the biological system, degeneracy seems to be ubiquitous. So there is no one way of achieving it. And degeneracy did not necessarily mean that, that only when one particular way of doing things, the other one comes into picture. Uh, you can have degeneracy manifesting in very different ways. Like uh, it could be like animal to animal variable. Animal one could perform the same task. Uh, by using uh, um, uh, a different set of structural components, uh, animal two could be doing it very differently. I mean, say, I mean, you can uh, 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 look at it from your own behavior. I mean, when you pick up something, for instance, uh, which part of the muscle that you use, uh, that itself is going to be very, very different uh, for picking up the same object. Uh, so you could have degeneracy manifesting as the same animal uh, using different structural components uh, to um, execute the same function. So now, this doesn't refer to fail safe mechanism. This is not necessarily fail safe mechanism. So, this is something which is, uh, I mean, fundamental, right? So, so why is this important? Why is this even important? It's important because, I mean, when we talk about uh, drugs that can cure diseases, uh, you assume that all the humans are exactly the same, and therefore they are going to use exactly the same structural component, exactly the same molecules for performing that function. And therefore, if you have a functional failure, uh, you target that single molecule, you will be able to cure that particular disorder. And it comes to the point where it, you realize that there is considerable structural I mean, heterogeneities in terms of how each and every human being is executing that particular function. And therefore, uh, if you block uh, um, a certain uh, ion channel, for instance, uh, then the function will be affected tremendously in one human being, uh, and the trauma function will not be, uh, I mean, changed at all in another human. Or even if you can look at I mean, you can look at it from um, ion channels and a single neuron function, the number of action potential cells. Yeah. You have different kinds of ion channels, uh, 
and you take out one ion channel basically in some animals or in some neurons you will have huge impact of that now, that influential will go from 1 to 25 right now, the other action from the other neuron will be firing at one and it will be still firing at one even if you take out the ion on the other hand some other ion channel would have a huge impact on that particular thing now, so for bringing about the same function which is eliciting the same number of action potentials now, the two neurons are using very different components basically right? so so it's it's like I mean think of it as uh, an overcomplete basis. Uh, right? So you have overcomplete representation. Or it's a property of a complex system, and the complex system here uh, the definition is that uh, you have uh, uh, a bunch of subsystems that are present. Uh, right? uh, each of them are having their own functional specialization. There are several subsystems associated with this. Uh, uh, you can I mean think of is at different levels you can think of a group of human beings each one doing a certain function now right so that's a complex system let's say they all have their functional specialization now and in an organization let's say when all of that comes together you have a functional integration that is happening now, which leads to the final functional outcome but there's not one way of reaching this in a complex system you can achieve the same functional outcome let's say i mean uh, 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 you, you want to I mean, the president is coming and you want to elect them or something, or you want to execute a certain project uh, that is part of this. So you can have different uh, faculty and different staff members of the institution executing the same project. In another scenario, you can have another set of people doing the same. So, so a complex system is one where you have functional specialization of the individual stuff. Uh, and the functional integration can happen because of interactions between these functionally specialized subsystems. Uh, but there is not one way of achieving that functional integration. You can have different ways of doing that system, right? So, so as I said, you can have the same system doing uh, um, different uh, the, the same function uh, in uh, using different components at different instances, or you could have parallel pathways recruited for that particular function. So, degeneracy can exhibit it may, um, exhibit in various different ways, and I mean in your day to day life, uh, you will see that degeneracy is kind of everywhere. You just have to notice it much more closely, and you will realize that. Uh, this is something that is ubiquitous uh, even uh, in our own day to day. So, so please read this paper. Uh, it, it, it kind of, uh, I mean, as I said, it changed the way of uh, how I think about biology, where uh, there's a one to one function, one to one relationship between this and that. Uh, functions are, uh, I mean, you can always uh, reduce it to the, uh, the bare minimum. And things like that. Yeah. And so, so, over the years, we have shown that uh, in the scenes, have different components. Uh, so, with reference to the function of individual neurons and how different ion channels contribute to it. Yeah. So this is the place cell that I was talking about. Yeah. Right. So the so place cell as opposed to the grid cell uh, fires at only one location basically. Right. So and you can get this firing rate pattern with various different combinations of ion channels, neural structures, and so on. So, yeah. so this is also neural encoding of space, yeah. but with reference to um, space, yeah. this is temporal coding, this is rate coding, yeah. and you can get this also. So you see that these five different uh, uh, curves are very, very similar. These five different curves are very, very similar. Uh, but if you look at the properties and the parameters associated with what it actually led to this, they're very different. Right? So, so you don't see that in the functional outcome. So, and degeneracy should not be mistake, mistaken with the, uh, oh, biology is in process. No, the function is process. Uh, function is exactly process. Uh, but that precise function is achieved through various different structural components. Right? So, so you execute the function still, the, the, the executed function is still precise, uh, but there is not one way to achieve that. Uh, there are several different ways. As I said, you can think of it as an overcomplete representation uh, where you can choose different basis vectors uh, and construct the, the final vector uh, from uh, different of them with different coefficients. And so, right? so, so it's an overcomplete system. So, so can we have an apology or so many moments? I don't know what exactly ensemble So, if you tell me what ensemble models are, I'll tell you whether it can be. Uh, we could have, say, multiple models coming from different way of constructing them. And then you can say, a strong I mean, so I mean, it, it shouldn't be rather than the same thing. Right? So, so, if you have different uh, models that are present, uh, uh, and if all of them are made up of uh, homogeneous networks, uh, uh, 
involved in necessarily heating structures that are not necessarily using the uh, different structural components. So, so the different structural components is the key, and that is how biological systems are able to maintain the kind of robustness that they are, are able to exhibit uh, uh, in reality. Yeah, because they can recruit one or the other solution. So that's the major difference between um, I mean studying the uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, say uh, uh, electrical system and a biological system. So in a micro, I mean, in, 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 in this computer, if the board doesn't work, you just throw it out, put another board down. And I mean, and you can study it even if this board is gone, this function, this particular function is gone, and therefore this board is for this particular function. On the other hand, in the biological system, you remove one component. Down. The system is adaptive, right? Mm -hmm. So it tries to compensate for that. It tries to make sure that that particular loss is not felt. Down. It finds another way to execute the same function now. And therefore, it becomes a I mean, it's an adaptive nonlinear system uh, which continually varies in response to what the environment throws at it. Yeah. And that is the major difference between studying the, uh, these non adaptive systems uh, and an adaptive system as this is. So, so, if the ensemble model that you're talking about accounts for these different aspects of biological systems, uh, it would be a model. Uh, but otherwise, and I mean, as I said, uh, this is not something which is um, one we observe at uh, the network scale, uh, you observe that it is observed throughout the entire structure, I mean, from genes to behavior all the way, you have degeneracy in each and every aspect of it. Uh, and therefore, uh, it becomes very, very uh, uh, important to account for all of those. And so, so again, over the years, uh, in this degeneracy is one of the, um, the uh, important themes of work in our lab, but we have shown it with various different characteristics. Uh, Basic physiological properties, uh, plasticity profiles, encoding characteristics, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, over the years. Uh, um, so, this is the review that we wrote uh, a few years ago uh, on degeneracy and how it actually can contribute to market capital such as So, so it's important to, I mean, when, when we think of biological systems uh, or when we think of complexity in biological system, uh, we always think of it as a, I mean, from the perspective of because of that, right? so so much complex, so much going on. I don't want to play with it. Uh, find the simplest possible solution. Parsimony is my is my go to uh, concept. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, that that complexity is not something that has to be that should be ignored uh, because that is what is resulting in this degeneracy. So you can have I me. Mean, why do you want uh, for? For a, for, a, for a system that could be specified by three different basis vectors. So, why do you want like 25 of them? Right? So, it serves a purpose. Right? So, can't just say pick the first three of them uh, and say, okay, this explains the whole thing. So, the rest 22 are useless. Uh, then you are not defining the system for what it is. Uh, you are imposing your ideas on the system, basically. Right? So, so, it's important to realize that degeneracy is not a problem. It is a I mean, it's evolution's ingenious solution to achieving. Uh, uh, robust biological function. So, so that complexity has to be respected. Uh, that uh, should be accounted for, uh, uh, and it should be realized that biological systems thrive because of the complexity, not despite it. Uh, that's the reason why they are able to be as robust as possible. Uh, so, there is not one solution, uh, and just because you can so show one solution, so usually the idea is, you know, I will simulate something, and if the input output characteristics of uh, my system matches with what the uh, the brain does. Uh, then uh, whatever component that is present in my system should be present in the brain of strong. And so because that's not how it works. Uh, so you have, uh, just because the input output characteristics is matching, and just because you have demonstrated a solution, it does not imply that that solution is unique, uh, or that the system is using that particular solution and not methodological. So, so it's, it's a very important concept, uh, um, and has to be accounted for what is ethology? Ethology is uh, uh, under normal, I mean, I mean, I say under ethological conditions, uh, under normal behavior. Say, for instance, you can catch hold of an animal and, uh, uh, I mean, inject a certain current into its brain and see how exactly it responds. That's not ethology. Okay. So, in its natural environment, how exactly, that, whether that particular solution is the opposite of ethology. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I mean, if the pathology is more like this is and uh, you just made it up. Uh, made you up. just made it up. Real and uh, uh, Okay. So the final oversimplification that I'm going to talk about today are 
The other cell types that are present in the brain, other than neurons, which are <coughs> what are called as the glial cells. Uh, so the name glia comes from the Greek word for blue, and the idea was, I mean, just like when people did not understand their rights, some um, they just assumed that they were funnels of information now and integrates information and passes it to the cell body. Yeah. At the time when glial cells were not understood, because these are tiny TV cells, they are also a few microns in diameter. So, so at that time we did not have the uh, the kind of data to uh, assess them in a manner that is uh, uh, understandable, and therefore uh, um, we assume that uh, they were just uh, providing the substrate. So neurons are the ones that are processing information. These are just present there, grooming them to that position, making sure that they don't fall apart from the brain now, and just stay there uh, and do the information process. So that's why the name came from this. But it turns out as the time progress and uh, we we started recording from these uh, cells as well. Uh, it turned out that uh, real cells are actively involved in, uh, in information processing uh, plasticity <coughs> as well as learning. Uh, it's not something which is uh, just present there like a blue display. Yeah. So, so how did this understanding come from? Again, we started recording them. Right? So in, in the human brain, uh, neuron, neuron and real cells are one to one almost. Uh, different species have different kinds of proportions. So, right? so, and uh, now it's clear that uh, they're not just sitting there doing nothing. Uh, they actually communicate with neurons. Uh, neurons communicate with them. Glial cells communicate with each other. Uh, so there is communication all over the place. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Sufyan's work. Uh, where he recorded from a uh, glial cell an astrocyte, uh, right, uh, which is present over here. So you see that these glial cells also kind of tessellate the, the space. Uh, uh, they have their own boundaries. Uh, and they don't interfere with somebody else's uh, uh, and they are present in this kind of uh, uh, tessellated structure and what Sufyan did was uh, he um, we, uh, recorded from two cells one was a neuron and another was a glial cell uh, and he activated the glial cell by making a certain molecule of it uh, uh, and when he did that uh, he found that in the neuron he started getting these huge responses uh, so before he activated the real cells, they were all tiny thing, yeah. but after that, uh, he saw this uh, huge increase in this uh, potential. And these, uh, take, these kind of activity patterns uh, are capable of uh, producing plasticity in these neural structures. So it's something that uh, uh, um, that also produces dynamic spikes, as he showed, uh, and they are also I mean, I mean, dependent upon the different ion channels that are present in the left side. Right? And so, so based on this, uh, uh, and several other things. Uh, so we have wrote this review talking about the parallel literatures in, in the dynamic field and the real field uh, um, and how they have to be accounted for. And there are several other uh, recent reviews uh, that talk about how um, these uh, layer cells have to be accounted for in all sorts of analysis. Uh, and they are not just present there out of, uh, I mean, just for, just as a nutritive uh, uh, value or as a clue. So, um, so that's all I have for today. Um, so, I mean, the first oversimplification that we talked about was uh, with reference to the perceptron itself. Uh, and we said that uh, neuron is a complex computation machine uh, with an active and right sustained bi directional flow of information. And if you want to, I mean, approximate the full glory of what a single neuron does, you need a full deep neural network for that. Um, and uh, um, the neurons are not. Uh, uh, Repeating uh, homogeneous units. Uh, they express uh, several forms of heterogeneity and they serve uh, important functions. It's important to account for those. So uh, I can just drop them and say that uh, I'll just take the average and move on with life. Uh, nothing will happen. Uh, so plasticity is not confined only to synapses. Uh, they span uh, uh, pretty much all components that are present and uh, they perform important functions. They can change that firing rates. Uh, they can change the band plus filtering structure, they can change the, um, the back propagating action potentials and whatnot. Uh, uh, and it's important not to think of uh, biological systems as one to one maps. Uh, there's one structure, one function. Uh, that's never the case here. Uh, uh, it's a many to many system, uh, by which I mean uh, there are many different subsystems that can execute uh, the same function. Uh, and uh, 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 a given subsystem can be part of several different functions. So they put it many, many, many uh, one to one. Uh, um, Glial cells are actively involved in information processing, plasticity, and learning. We are not just. There are several other oversimplifications, which uh, 
I won't have time to talk about it. Uh, those are just some of them that I just wrote up there. Uh, so that's all I have. Clear trophy is kind of the opposite, I mean, a counterpart of degeneracy. Degeneracy is a scenario where uh, different structural components uh, there is at the same function. Uh, so, clear trophy is where one single component yeah, one can, can execute multiple functions at different times. So, 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 that's what the clear trophy is. So, that's all I have. Thanks. Can the action potential for the cell will uh, change with time? Yes, it can change in terms of the amplitude, it can change in terms of the width, it can change in terms of how much it goes below. So, all aspects of an action potential are controlled by different types. Those are the impressions that an action potential stays more or less around 50 millivolts or something. And around 100 millivolts. Uh, but, uh, no, but that it can change. Yeah. The amplitude can change, yes. Uh, um, it, it, it depends upon the specific kind of antenna that are expressed in that. And the width also matters okay? so because the width determines the uh, um, I mean, so, so when the action potential reaches the, the synaptic location, uh, so there is a certain amount of calcium that comes into the presynaptic neuron, uh, and that calcium is what is releasing neurotransmitters into the uh, synaptic cleft. Uh, right? So, so the width of the action potential would determine how much calcium comes inside. So, it's the area under the curve. Uh, so, there's no real difference between the greatest potential and the action potential. You can refer, you are asking whether uh, action potentials can be graded. Yeah, I think I'm going to grade. Yes, I mean, so as I showed that if you look at the back propagating action potential amplitude, uh, they can be anywhere between uh, 0 millivolts and 100 millivolts. Uh, so there is no need for them to be uh, 100 millivolts action potentials. Uh, they can, and even the genetic pipes, uh, they can also be of variable amplitude, depending upon the kind of ion channels that are expressed over there. Uh, so the the idea of action potentials being all or none still holds uh, as it propagates along the axon, where it is repeated that there are the nodes of Ranvey which keep amplifying them uh, and eventually it reaches uh, to the the presynaptic terminal. Uh, but in many other places, you can get uh, uh, graded action potentials. So in this context, what is stochasticity and noise? Stochasticity in this context is uh, if you present the same stimulus uh, to a neuron or an animal, uh, it would respond very differently in each and every time. So the, the trial to trial variability is what is referred to as uh, stochasticity. Yeah. And that comes because uh, of the fact that the ion channels that I talked about, uh, they are binary basically, they are open or not closed. Right? So, and because there are seven of them present, uh, each of them opens from that. When we talk about a sick point, uh, what it means is the probability of opening with reference to a given voltage. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are open and staying there. So these are molecules which are many of the atoms are wiggling and, uh, and jiggling for the ions to come through. So I mean, these are um, different uh, ion channels opening at different time points, uh, and the ensemble is what eventually generates the action so, uh, uh, or whatever physiological outcome the neuron does. So, so, because of um, the probabilistic nature of the opening and closing, yeah, so that is what is called as channel loss. Yes. So, so, and that contributes to, say, for instance, if you find if you inject a, 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 a 250 bit current to a cell, uh, it will not fire action potential exactly at the same timing, even if you repeat it over and over again. No. Each and every trial will be different. So, that comes as a consequence of channel loss. Similarly, when you talk about synapses, uh, um, it's not like I mean, so th this is something that we assume uh, uh, in neural networks, for instance, that it's a reliable structure. Whenever there's a presynaptic action potential that comes into the stuff, there will be a postsynaptic response. But here, that's not the case. Especially if you look at hippocampal and cortical neurons, uh, the synapses have a least probability of 0.3. <laughs> if you do it 100 times, if this receives an action potential, uh, 30 times it will I mean, send an output to the next level, basically. So that is. Uh, and that is because of the kind of molecules that are involved in the release process. So, so they don't even release neurotransmitters into the cleft. Uh, and therefore, the probabilities uh, uh, are very low. So, so, I mean, you may say, I mean, maybe that is biological systems are stupid and therefore they don't, uh, uh, I mean, they are not reliable and therefore I will just ignore it and make my system reliable because I'm smart. Uh, turns out it's the other way around. Uh, the biological systems, the, 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 the probability of release uh, it uses it as a mechanism for generating synaptic filters. Uh, right? So, 
So if you have active potentials coming at high frequency, there are one kind of synapses uh, which would let the lower frequency inputs to pass through much more effectively. There are another kind of synapses which would let, as a consequence of uh, this probability of release uh, and the stochasticity associated with it, uh, that would let, uh, um, if the first one was high frequency inputs to go much more effectively, another one would be like low frequency inputs would go much more effectively. Yeah. There are even synapses uh, which would allow active potentials uh, specific frequencies to other action. Right? So, so that that is brought about by this uh, uh, release probability. And this is an additional layer of filtering other than what I talked about in, in Denrex, uh, where I am channels in the water. Uh, so this is simply a consequence of this. And therefore, it's not an LPA system. It's not linear time invariant. Uh, so you have, uh, you can't assume that, I mean, it's dependent upon history action. So it, it's, uh, it's not even more uh, so you have a memory um, that is uh, built up on several action potentials uh, and it keeps track of that uh, and that is what eventually leads to what exactly the output is. So, so that assumption also is something which we implicitly make. Right? So we assume that it is LDI, we assume that there is no memory. Um, all those assumptions have to go um, if, um, if uh, you have to approximate what the neuron is. And as I said, they are not there because the biological systems are stupid. Uh, Evolution is like a millions of millions, billions and billions of years old. That we have been studying neuroscience for like decades. Uh, and we have still a lot of time to catch up this thing. So, so I mean, it had it has had like millions of years of optimization now for arriving at this solution now, and therefore uh, it's important to respect that uh, and say that uh, I mean, <laughs> show me what the hell you are looking. Why do you have this stochasticity? What is the use of this? Uh, I, instead of assuming that, oh, you're stupid, I don't want to study you. I mean, uh, I will make a smarter system which is much more reliable. Than it turns out that your system is stupid. That system is smart. And so, because as I said, uh, that system has had millions of years. Uh, it's just any glitches uh, in uh, that scheme of things. Uh, so, so, I mean, as I said, it's, it's, it, it, the, the, the biological system is where the real question uh, questions are there. Uh, um, and therefore, that's more interesting. That's why I switched over to neuroscience. Which might come like an infinite years later, by which time I wouldn't be there. So, I have a question. So, uh, I have worked a little bit. So, on uh, um, connectomes and all of that, it's looked at different regions of the brain. So the question I have is you had mentioned that you know it expresses degeneracy across all scales. So the scale means the spatial scale. Scales means uh, um, um, does it mean when we talk about scales, we talk about I mean uh, biology research goes at different scales, uh, mm -hmm. like behavioral scale, uh, okay. system scale, neuron scale, molecular scale, the uh, genetic scale. Uh, so that is what we mean by scales. So it does it mean the same as neuron to neuron and population to regions of the brain? Yes, yes, sir. That's, so what what would you say are the generations you see at the uh, at you know the uh, coarser scales, right? Like uh, neuron is a very sir. fine scale, right? Ah, so at a different, I mean, uh, at, so if you look at the list that uh, Edelman and Gary have, it's, it has uh, across all the scales. So, so here you would think of, like, say, for instance, that uh, you have different brain regions, uh, and they all I mean a bunch of neurons are generating active production. And as I said, uh, the cerebellar neuron is very different from the hippocampal neuron, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, for executing the same task at the behavioral level, uh, uh, one animal will recruit uh, uh, neurons in the hippocampus, neurons in the amygdala, and so on and so forth. Uh, and for executing the same task, uh, Another animal could be recruiting uh, another set of neurons from different brain regions and executing the same So, so that is where degeneracy is manifest in that case. And you may have mentioned that degeneracy is different from redundancy. Uh, yes. How would you? So, because in redundancy, you have the same the the, the, the key phrase in degeneracy is the, the fact that they have to be structurally different. Right. So, so if you have like. I mean, um, uh, you say, say, for instance, if you have a three dimensional vector space and you have one zero zero over two, zero over one zero and zero zero one, uh, you have like different copies of one zero zero and uh, zero one yeah. zero. And if, if that fails for some reason, now uh, you take the next one and fix it. On the other hand, if you have a over complete representation, now uh, 
you don't have to rely on the same set of three or four or whatever number that you're using. The, you can use the all 22 with different coefficients. So the coefficients will be different across different implementations. So, so that would be the norm. So redundancy is very simple. I mean, as I said, the, the triple battery would be an example of, uh, of uh, redundancy. Or, I mean, I could be giving this top setting in IRC across, I mean, talking to my Mac, uh, or here I come and talk to real people and do the same talk. Uh, um, or, I mean, I use uh, a laser pointer versus my pen. Uh, so different structural components oh, execute the same thing. Thanks. That's the difference. Uh, it's catastrophic for getting the, I mean, the bad biological systems don't exhibit catastrophic for the That is the we get the same or which we can see. We, uh, there are several reasons why that could be happening. We don't know the answer of this. I mean, as I keep saying, working about neuroscientists, uh, we start our answers by saying that we don't know the answer. Right. So, so um, I mean, um, the uh, the reason why it may not be existing uh, uh, could be because of uh, the fact that plasticity is ubiquitous, uh, and therefore, how exactly it shares the resources uh, for different learning processes could be very different. Uh, right? So, so there's a propensity for certain neurons and certain synapses to be recruited uh, for a certain task, uh, and when the next task comes into picture. Uh, these neurons are not available for that particular learning process because the context has changed and therefore there will be some neuromodulatory input or some kind of a change that is happening in these systems uh, which would allow another set of resources, another set of neurons and synapses and components that are present in the net to change uh, and therefore you would have that. That's one way of achieving it. This is where, I mean, it's, it's, if you will, trivial continual learning where you have your research, resources are, I mean, extremely huge. Uh, Resource allocation is just a problem of finding non-overlapping sets of different processes. So, the other way of looking at it is that um, people also think of it as uh, um, temporal dynamics. Uh, right? So it would be the same set of neurons that are present, uh, but one sequence of neurons, so say for instance, you have 20 neurons. Uh, in the sequence four, five, six, seven, eight uh, encodes uh, one particular uh, memory sequence, let's say. And you could have another memory sequence which could be encoded by say 7, 6, uh, 23, or we don't have 23, 19, uh, 18, and so on and so forth. Even though 6 was common now, uh, you still have a different sequence that is encoded. Uh, and therefore, the sequence decides what exactly the final outcome is, uh, not necessarily whether a given neuron fires on it. So, so it's encoded in the population. So, so there are several theories about how exactly that could be achieved. Uh, uh, but I mean, those are all the things. Uh, we don't know how it works. So does all kind of forgetting have to be catastrophic? The catastrophic forgetting is just defined as I mean, you learn another task, the first task is gone. Okay. And so that is what catastrophic okay. forgetting is. Uh, um, continual learning. Uh, I mean, the continual adaptation I meant by that is uh, so you don't think of, I mean, artificial learning networks, there's a training piece, training phase, and there's a uh, phase where, I mean, it is under normal use, basically. Uh, here, on the other hand, the brain is continually adapting. You are not, there, there is no rest, there is nothing called as a static equilibrium in the brain. Now, at best, it is a dynamic equilibrium uh, and it is continually changing with response to whatever inputs it is receiving. Uh, and that continual adaptation is something that we will have to come here also. Because you can't just say that, I mean, I've stopped learning now, I don't want to learn anything. Uh, you can do that. <laughs> For those who are online, if there are any questions, please put them on chat. Uh, so thanks a lot, Professor, for a very interesting talk. Uh, we could actually see how uh, real world like uh, neurons are so uh, complex than uh, the artificial neurons neurons which we use in uh, artificial neural networks. I had uh, a follow up question on uh, what JMM was asking on degeneracy. So uh, uh, can we uh, like? Uh, for a specific situation, can we find which uh, solution among, let's say, the uh, bag of solutions is used uh, for a specific case, like out of all the available options? Very good question. <laughs> uh, so we think of it as uh, so, so, so. So you have, as I said, uh, in a complex system, uh, you have uh, several different uh, subsystems, each one having a functional specialization. Now. And the kind of interactions that happen between them gives you the outcome, basically. Right? So, so now the question is, which of these several solutions are you going to pick up in a given instance? So, 
So the answer to that lies uh, uh, from a broader perspective lies uh, 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 in, in, in two words, uh, um, uh, error correction basically. So you have, uh, in general, you think of it as uh, uh, a continually adapting system, uh, right? Uh, and depending upon which context that particular neuron is uh, or the network is or the system is, uh, you would have uh, uh, the ability of one particular solution to be taken. Right? So, but you should be able to follow that path, follow those uh, series of changes towards reaching that next solution. Now, towards achieving a specific goal. Right? So, so that goal is your criteria. So you will have an error correcting feedback mechanism, uh, which would uh, either bring about what's called as homeostasis, where you would make sure that, say, for instance, you are interested in achieving a certain firing rate of right? so, so, and depending upon, uh, um, so it will be a continually adapting system, uh, which would ensure that uh, you would keep changing it until um, that particular goal is achieved. Uh, so that is one way of uh, uh, thinking about it. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the more important, very important questions. Uh, we know that the animal uses uh, um, different solutions at different contexts. Uh, we know that different animals use different solutions, even though they have the same exact components present. Uh, but at a given context, uh, how exactly do you choose one solution over the other? Uh, the generic answer for which there are several uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, and computational lines of uh, evidence uh, uh, is that there is an error corrective feedback loop which uh, um, brings about the choice of one over the other. And the specific uh, 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 specific uh, context uh, of uh, the system basically drives the system towards one solution or the other. So, so some of this we would cover in that review that I talked about the, the stable continual learning. Uh, um, um, please uh, take a look at that. Sure, yeah. thanks. Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I had actually one more question. Uh, so uh, this is more re related to the artificial neural networks which we use. So basically, uh, artificial neural networks are like an abstraction of this uh, real world uh, neural networks. And um, uh, like you pointed out, there are a lot of oversimplifications. Uh, uh, so, which are not uh, actually uh, modeled into the artificial neural network. So, uh, could you recommend some of the ways like how we could uh, incorporate at least some of these characteristics into artificial neural networks? Uh, I have put in uh, reviews uh, at the end of each of the, uh, the summary slide associated with each of those uh, um, I mean individual references, individual oversimplifications. Uh, I put in a bunch of uh, uh, review references like me when I talked about active dendrites. Uh, I showed you a bunch of review references. Uh, uh, so, for here, for scale, for instance, uh, so you have uh, uh, this review that came up recently, which talks about drawing inspiration from biological networks. Uh, and these are review papers which talk about uh, um, several ways by which this has been. Uh, which I put review papers because they are overall summaries, and there is also heterogeneity. For instance, uh, there are papers that account for, uh, including ours, uh, there are papers that account for uh, uh, heterogeneity during learning and stuff like that. Uh, so each of those uh, individual oversimplifications, I have provided certain references uh, from where you could take uh, forward that line of thinking. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll leave these slides uh, uh, with somebody and uh, we can follow. Sure. Thanks a lot, Professor. Thank you. We can conclude today, sir. So. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, coming over and giving us a fantastic token of appreciation.